As a social experiment, before today's session, before you arrive, I placed a $100 bill under five seats in this auditorium. Take a moment now to look and see if you're one of the winners. Any winners? No? How do you feel? From the looks of it, some of you feel silly. But if you came into the room this morning depending on that money to take care of your family, you would feel manipulated, misled. Some of you would feel anger and maybe want to take out that anger on the one who made that promise to you, me. Well, you now have a whiff of what some of my African-American brothers and sisters, some of my Latino brothers and sisters, some of the poor and powerless feel whenever we hear that America is the land of opportunity. When we hear that America is the land of opportunity and we look at our situations, we look at our mothers and our fathers, our foremothers and our forefathers, we look at the scarcity of opportunities in our community, we look at the scarcity of opportunities in the world for the poor and the powerless. And we feel cheated. We feel manipulated. We feel misled. For too long, the poor and the powerless have been provoked by the possibility of the American dream without the actual reality of having a chance to achieve it. But the good news is that America can become the land of opportunity for everyone. America can become a place where everyone has a place to live in dignity, where everyone has something healthy to eat, where everyone has an opportunity to take care of their family. At Grayston, we not only believe that the poor and the powerless had value, we believe that our very success depended on it. And so we set out to do differently. But Julius, why, why should those that have, those that are rich and powerful, why should they do differently? I'm glad you asked. First, and we heard from Will and we heard from Greg, and we heard from Mark that because God says so. The Old Testament, Deuteronomy 10 and 18 in the New Testament, James 1 and 27, both tell us to take care of the widow and the orphans. Why the widows and the orphan? You're on the game today asking questions. I love it. <laughs> because they are the poor and the powerless and they can't take care of themselves. And so at Grayson, we decided that's exactly who we would reach out to. That's exactly who we would employ. But we knew we needed to do it differently. We knew we needed to teach them. We needed to trust them. And then we needed to give them time. Teach, trust, and give time. We knew we needed to teach them a new set of behaviors, new skill sets. Needed to give them competencies, marketable competencies that they could take even when they left Grayston. I remember Celia. Celia worked for us and she had for her whole life been on welfare. Both when she was living with her parents and then when she was living on her own. And she had two children, and she came and she applied for Grace to, to Grayston for a job. And our hiring practice, we called open hiring, meaning the first person to apply for a job would get the job regardless of their background. We didn't care where they were from. We didn't care what they had done. We only cared about what they were going to do. And so Celia applied for a job that she would not have gotten elsewhere because she had no workforce background. 
And she got an opportunity, and she came into our apprentice program. And we, we had an apprentice program. When I first arrived at Grayston, they had a probationary program. Probation. You were on probation when you came to work there for 90 days. Some of us have been on probation when we've gone to our various jobs, but it meant something different to some of the employees at Grayson, because some of them were on probation. <laughs> or they knew someone who was on probation, or had been on probation. So probation had a negative connotation to it. It's the time frame, even at a job or when you've been released from prison, that they're watching to see if you'll continue to do the right thing. Said another way, watching to see if you'll fail. And I wanted to change that energy from watching to see if you would fail to supporting you while you succeeded, to teaching you how to succeed. And so we had an apprenticeship. And Cecilia was in our apprenticeship. She came to work every day on time. And you could see she was trying hard, but there was something just not quite right. And thank God that her supervisor had developed a relationship with her. And, and Cecilia confided in her that Cecilia couldn't read. And so we brought someone in to evaluate where she was at, and we, we found out, quite frankly, Celia found out she was dyslexic. She had gone her entire life through elementary school, through middle school, through most of high school, and then dropped out, albeit, I'm sure, because she couldn't uh, function in the classroom, not being able to read at the ages of 14 or 15 or 16. And so we provided her some assistance. We were able to find someone in the city who could give her classes, and we allowed her to take that class two to three times a week on the clock for an hour, two to three times a week. Because we knew if she had to do it off the clock, she would either have to give up earnings or time with her young children. And Celia became a supervisor for us, someone we depended on. So you had to teach new skills, new competencies, but then you also have to trust. One time, uh, uh, one of the local news stations came to interview me, and they wanted to interview some of our workers. And uh, they interviewed a gentleman by the name of Willie. And I loved the reporter and his exchange back and forth with Willie. He found out from Willie on camera that Willie had been in and out of prison most of his life. And the reporter said to him, Willie, so why are you making it now? You seem, you've, you've got it. You seem things are going well. Why are you making it now? And Willie said, well, they gave me a chance. And I love that the reporter kept pressing on Willie, kept pressing on him, because he said, you, 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 you had chances before, but you didn't make it. Why now? And Willie said, because they trust me. Willie had gotten through our apprenticeship program and was now the head of our packing. He packed all of our gourmet cakes that went out to top-level restaurants throughout New York City and shipped across the country. A perfect opportunity for theft. And he said, but they trusted me. When you trust someone, you empower them. You depend on them. And Willie said we depended on him, and that's what made the difference. And, and up until that point, uh, we were trusting people, but we didn't know how critical of a component it was to their success. And that became part of our literature that we talked about teaching and trusting. But you also have to give time. I've often said that I'm part of the we in the poor and the powerless, because I grew up in the projects in public housing. And two gentlemen, Leonard Halpert and Joe Kaufman, president and vice president of the 40th largest black-owned company back in that day, two white gentlemen took time to work with me, to teach me business administration, to teach me finance, to teach me manufacturing, to teach me to trade cocoa. And I never, learned, uh, I never forgot that lesson, to teach others. But when I got to Grayson, I wasn't that smart, so I didn't know how to, how to teach. And, and so we had about 25 employees when I first got there, and, I, and I'm trying to teach each and every one of them. I want to know their names. I want to know their stories, what's going on at home, what are the struggles at work. How can I help them all? And for a little while, I kept all of those balls in the air. But as we grew to 40 employees, it became overwhelming. And I remember one day going to the other uh, management teams of the other Grayson corporations and saying, this is too much. I need help. We need to figure this out. 
And what I decided to do at Grayson was I would take five to ten. It depended on the time that I was there, whether it was five, six, seven, or ten under my wing that I would teach directly and then empower them to take five to ten underneath their wings and teach them. And I remember in particular Rodney. Rodney came to Grayston, and when I, when I met him and got to know him, I would tell him and others that he was the smartest person in the building, bar none, including myself. Rodney was gifted. Rodney could lead a team. Rodney could do sales. Rodney could do accounting. He kept inventory. Okay, it was drugs on the corner, but, but Rodney had skills. <laughs> Rodney was gifted. And we had to teach him how to apply that. He wanted to show his family something different. But up until he found out about Grayson, the only opportunity he and many other young African-American men see is the opportunity to sell drugs. But being as smart as he was, he knew he wouldn't live that long. And so Rodney wanted something different. He came to work for Grayson. But he struggled. And we would try to teach him, but what he was hearing was us telling him stuff. And so we had to give it time during the apprenticeship period. I had to give my time, and I got to know Rodney. And we developed a relationship, and, and we moved from when he thought I was telling him something to the fact that I was teaching him something. But that only happened because of time, building that relationship. And Rodney eventually became the production manager for a bakery that produced 20,000 pounds of brownies a day. All the brownies for Ben and Jerry's chocolate fudge brownie ice cream. Your now new flavored, uh, flavor of ice cream. <laughs> Rodney became the production manager. He eventually left the bakery, wanted to go into the food industry, and I invested my personal money in starting a restaurant, and Rodney became an equity partner because he was gifted. You see, when we properly empower the poor and the powerless. They will become productive participants in our population. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. So I, I think from a business manager perspective, and you tell me about hiring somebody, and you hire the first person that walks in, and you give them an opportunity, and, and that opportunity to teach and to learn and to thrive and to grow, and it works. Um, when I introduced you, you're vice president of a $23 million business, and you've got a $7 million business that you were CEO of. And as I think about that, could you, could you talk a little bit about how the profit motive factors in in God's economy? Because obviously what you did was you invested in people. Yes. And it worked in a profit-driven way. Could you just connect that a little bit? Sure. Um, I mean, a lot of people ask uh, when I talk about Grayson and talk about the stories. I, I could tell you hundreds of stories about hundreds of individuals. And some ask, well, does it work from a profit point of view? Well, when I took over in 1997, uh, we were break even. In 2001, we earned a profit two and a half times that of the mid-sized bakery. By 2004, we had built a $10 million facility based on the merits of the bakery and the business. But the nut was so large that we almost went bankrupt in 2006. And I set all the employees down. And I explained to them what was going on. And we practiced open book management. And we taught them finances. We used personal budgets, talking about uh, food as inventory, talking about uh, uh, clothing as packaging, talking about rent as our mortgage, and taught them how to read financial statements. And by 2009, I left the business. And today, they are more profitable than they ever have been. They still practice open hiring, and they still practice the apprenticeship. <laughs>